This is CBC Here and Now. It's a drag. An impromptu performance in downtown St. John's was fun for some, while others ignored distancing. Masks do reduce the transmission rate in a population. Starting Monday, masks will be mandatory in all indoor public spaces in Newfoundland and Labrador. We will take a look at where you have to wear them and why it's so important. We've got sunshine now, but will it last this weekend? People at the pedestrian mall in downtown St. John's were treated to an unexpected performance last night, a drag show. But with crowds and COVID regulations top of mind, the performance is getting backlash today from some who feel that safety went by the wayside. And as here and now as Parjvala Dikshit reports, the city is issuing a reminder about safety and asking permission. Water Street was alive with dance, music and drag last night. Here at the pedestrian mall, a group of drag queens organized a kind of pop-up performance. But not everyone is happy about it. What concerns me is that we have these government mandates to socially distance, to wear masks, to have X amount of numbers within businesses. And what I saw last night was complacency by the general public. What, but what I also saw was a lack of police presence. The social media witch hunt, unfortunately, goes to the bar owners. And, you know, there are a lot of them doing the rules and they're losing money because of it. Fact of the matter is, I'm a new mother and I haven't brought my child down here, as you can see behind me. People are not socially distancing on the roads here. And who is enforcing that? They're, who's responsible for that? I don't know if it's the city itself that should be enforcing it, but the fact of the matter is there haven't been many cases in Newfoundland and people have become quite complacent. But Stephanie Moist had a front row seat and she says the pictures are misleading. Uh, where I sat, uh, that particular venue, um, their protocol was spot on. For Moist, a performer herself, the show was a much needed break after months of pandemic. I think what happens is as much as entertainers want to perform, um, people want to relate to the arts again. So it's not just the performers missing out, but it's the audience as well. There's been some blowback from local musicians who say the show and others like it shouldn't be allowed. Local drag artist David Blunden organized and performed Thursday night. He says drag isn't the same as a music show because the performers aren't actually singing. It's different. One of the things people have to learn, we don't sing. We're lip singing. So that's one of the rules you're not supposed to sing. Um, we don't share mics. Um, there's a, so there's, there's, there's different rules for different performers. And I get it. I mean, there's, there's bands here in the city suffering. But Blunden agrees COVID restrictions weren't respected. Not everyone maintained distance, and that's a problem. I will be the first one to admit and agree with what's on social media. There was times that there was not social distancing happening here last night. I think what happened was, one, it was more people showed up for this one. Uh, I know in previous events we had probably maybe 100 people show interest. This one we had a uh, couple of 300 people showed interest. We weren't trying to break any rules. We weren't trying to go through any loopholes. We were just trying to do something for the community. The City of St. John's and the Department of Public Health were not consulted. Today, both issued a reminder that outdoor events on city property must be approved by the city and to adhere to the province's COVID-19 guidelines. Despite this controversy, one young performer, seven-year-old Cody Anthony Fagan, who also goes by Liliana, hopes that his first foray into drag won't be his last. For CBC News, Prajwala Dikshit, St. John's. Newfoundland and Labrador is heading into the weekend COVID-free. The province's two active cases have recovered, which means our total active cases is back to zero. Starting on Monday, it will be mandatory for people over the age of five to wear masks in indoor public spaces. Now, some still have many questions about Monday's new rule, where and when you have to wear them, and why is it important to wear a mask properly? Here and now's Heather Gillis breaks it all down for us. Back one loop around one ear. Even though there were no active cases of COVID-19 in the province starting Monday, everyone over the age of five has to wear a mask covering their nose and mouth in indoor public places. You'll have to wear them in stores, at churches, funeral homes, and government buildings. 
You'll also have to wear a mask in an elevator in the common area of office buildings like the lobby or reception, in bathrooms and in break rooms. You'll also have to wear them in indoor entertainment centers like theaters and in museums, hair salons and hotels. In fitness centers, sports facilities, dance and yoga studios, you must wear one until your workout starts and then put it on again after you're done. Masks will also be mandatory if you take any sort of public transportation, whether it be a taxi, a provincial ferry or a metro bus. Masks do reduce the transmission rate in a population significantly. Immunologist Sherry Christian says making masks mandatory is the only way to ensure people are wearing them at high rates indoors. Outdoors is less important because we have this wind and we have a lot of air movement so if I was breathing out virus it wouldn't go very far. But indoors we don't have that. We have a lot of still air and of course we tend to stand close and close enough that virus is easily transmitted. So the mask provides a layer of protection. But there are a few exceptions to the rules about wearing masks in indoor public spaces. People with physical or mental health conditions that prevent them from wearing a mask should wear a face shield instead. And you don't have to wear them for the duration of some treatments and services like at the dentist or spa or when you're showing identification. Well, if you go to a restaurant, food court, or lounge, you can take off your mask while you're seated. That's provided others are two meters away from your bubble. But if you get up to move around, well, you have to put it back on. Meanwhile, Christian has some tips about storing your mask properly. Uh, I found a little pencil case, an old pencil case in my office, and I thought that would be the perfect thing to store my mask. Yep, so hold it by the elastics or the edges. And when it comes to wearing a mask, she says don't touch the front handle it by the earpieces, and if you're wearing glasses. So what I do is just make sure this is really as tight as I can get it, and then I, and as high as I can get it, so I can put my glasses down over top, and then we don't get any clogging. This mask doesn't have the wire, but if I did have a wire, I could make a really nice seal, and I would She also says remember to wash your fabric masks regularly. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. A possible strike on ferries has been delayed. The union that represents five ferry captains, sorry, the union that represents ferry captains for five routes has agreed to further talks with the provincial government. That means ferry schedules won't be affected until at least Tuesday. Here now's Garrett Berry has this update. It felt right down to the wire. Rumors were still swirling even here in the car lineup. But at 3.30 p.m., the MV veteran blew its horn and loading began. This run would have been the first cancelled if captains went on strike. The province has prepared an essential services schedule that is scaled down, meaning most days there'd only be one round trip here. These ferry captains have been without a contract for eight years, and their union says they haven't seen a pay raise since 2012. Lawyer Andrew Nielsen says the captains are fighting for fairness. The provincial government says negotiations have stalled as the union sent challenges to the Labor Relations Board and to the courts. Five runs inside the province would have been affected. Now, both sides have agreed to further discussion. There's been no change yet to the schedule, but some people have changed their plans. I spoke to one family who cut short their trip to Fogo Island because they were worried about getting back. If there is a disruption next week, priority will be given to essential workers essential goods, and those with medical appointments. Garrett Berry, CBC News, farewell. Unionized workers with Dominion will soon know if they're going on strike. Unifor will announce the results of the ratification vote count tomorrow night. Now about 1,300 workers at 11 stores have been voting all month on a tentative deal offered by Loblaws companies. If the offer is not accepted, a strike will begin immediately. Back in June, Lobla ended a $2 an hour wage increase for essential workers during the pandemic. The company also cut 60 full-time jobs in 2019, converting them to part-time positions. The results of tomorrow's vote are expected to be released at 10 p.m. A guidance counselor apologized at Robin McGraw's assault trial today for not reporting alleged instances of abuse earlier. The first week of the trial has brought plenty of emotion and horror in the courtroom. As Ryan Cook reports, who knew what and when is becoming a focal point.
Today we heard more from a guidance counselor who says that she's sorry she didn't come forward sooner. She says that she sat on information about McGraw's abusive behavior for eight months. She's the second staff member who says that they failed in their duty to report abuse. The guidance counselor says that she saw Principal McGraw scream and swear at two young students. Under questioning today by defense lawyer Tom Johnson, she showed how McGraw allegedly picked one boy up in his chair and slammed it on the floor. Standing next to McGraw today, the woman lifted her chair about three feet off the floor, slammed it down twice. McGraw is expected to take the stand and deny this allegation and all the others against him. The guidance counselor says she didn't come forward because of the toxic culture at the school. Like the other three witnesses, she waited until near the end of the school year to step forward. She says that McGraw bragged about having connections at the school board level, and she says she didn't feel that anyone would believe her if she went up against him. Trial resumes on Monday with more witnesses from inside what sounds like a very troubled school. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. We've had three solid evenings here in St. John's in a row. Nice start to the weekend. Things will start to get a little bit unsettled for parts of the island, certainly up through Labrador as we head through the weekend. I'll have all those details and your full forecast coming up.
This weather update is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. This year, it's Stay Home Year, the year to rediscover home. Well, another beautiful sunny day in the city of St. John's, as you can see behind our very own Ashley there. Ashley, what do you got for us weather-wise? Is this going to continue? Well, plenty of uh, more sunshine in the forecast for some areas more uh, certainly, but uh, as we head through the next couple of hours, things are going to start to get a little bit unsettled for parts of the province. Let's take a look at the temperatures though this afternoon. The first half of the day was stunning. We saw temperatures in the 20s for most areas and uh, into the single or uh, rather just the low double digits up through parts of Labrador, 10 degrees in Nain, 13 in Lab City, but uh, yeah, lots of 20 degree temperatures and uh, shaping up to be a beautiful evening as well temperature wise certainly in the east 21 degrees in St. John's as we speak and uh, similar temperatures across the board now things are starting to get a little bit unsettled we talked about uh, that area of low pressure yesterday up through Labrador and that's still in place and then if we zoom in a little bit, we can see uh, that cloud cover moving in and the showers and some thunderstorms along the west coast. Now, the best uh, dynamics for these thunderstorms is over the water. However, there is some chance that we're going to see some thunderstorms for the northern peninsula along the west coast. And then a slight chance that we could see some thunder or hear a few rumbles of thunder through central. The future tracker points at the fact that we'll see some showers overnight heading through central, certainly after midnight, and then some increasing cloud here in the east as we head through the next couple of hours. Uh, some high cloud will move in first, and then we'll see the potential for some showers in the early morning hours in the east. But overall, those temperatures are going to be pretty nice. Uh, 16 degrees, the overnight low in St. John's. The winds will stay up a little bit, uh, 20 to 40 kilometers per hour generally out of the west southwest the winds will ease in the west but low-lying areas will likely see single digit temperatures tonight grand falls winds are going down to seven degrees and four for lab city tonight but staying uh, partly cloudy for you the rest of the big land you're looking at the potential for showers now tomorrow the first half of the day some lingering showers possible in eastern areas but then it looks like a pretty lovely afternoon. Some slight, slight chance that we'll see some sh pop-up showers uh, in the afternoon through Central, but overall a pretty lovely Saturday. And then some unsettled conditions through Labrador, thanks to that area of low pressure. It does move further offshore, but you're still looking at that potential for some showers, and that'll move towards the Northern Peninsula into the evening and overnight hours on Saturday. Now, temperatures will be beautiful. Another 20 degree day for most of us with the winds 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. I've left the chance, uh, at least the rain out of the icons through central. But again, don't be surprised if you see a few pop up showers. And then uh, chilly temperatures again into the low. 8, 11 degree mark for Nain, 16 for Happy Valley Goose Bay, and 15 for Lab City. You'll more than likely see a few peaks of sun. Now, Sunday, that low will move further offshore, allowing a little bit more sunshine to peak out through Labrador, but still unsettled with the potential for some showers right across the board. And then showers, those showers from the Northern Peninsula will make their way through to the Bonavista Peninsula, uh, potentially the northern portion of the Avalon as well through uh, the day on Sunday. Otherwise, it's looking like plenty of sunshine. Then the next system will roll in and it looks like we'll see more steadier showers, uh, maybe even some thunderstorms on Monday as well. Here's those temperatures again into the 20 degree range on Sunday. So we're hanging on to these beautiful summer like temperatures, 16 degrees in Lab City and 10 for Nain. And into Monday, even uh, those temperatures still again, 20 degree day, it looks like for St. John's dipping into the high teens through central, uh, just as we see a little bit more rain and cloud cover move through and about 15 degrees will be the afternoon high for Cartwright on Monday. The five-day forecast taking us a little bit unsettled as we head into the middle of next week. Uh, temperatures really not moving much though within a couple of degrees from what we're seeing now and then for uh, central and western Newfoundland again a little bit unsettled as we head into Wednesday Tuesday looks nice, but then Wednesday looks like we'll see that potential for some showers. Again, note those temperatures are going to dip into the single digits, it looks like, overnight into uh, next week. For eastern Labrador, generally gray, maybe a few peaks of sun Sunday and Monday, but overall generally gray days. And that's the plan, for, or at least that's what's on tap for western Labrador as well as we get back into those 10 to 12 degree range by Tuesday and Wednesday.
Look at this lovely shot. This is some storm clouds that rolled through Port Rexton. Uh, great shot there. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Lynn. And if you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Another, another beautiful picture, Ashley. Keep them coming. Storm clouds are, yeah, storm clouds are my favorite. <laughs> A local fisherman got quite the fright out on the water last week. Gary Goodyear was fishing for turbot on the Grand Banks. The nets were down about 460 fathoms. And when they hauled up the gear later that after afternoon, he was shocked to see a scary looking creature. But let's let him tell you about it. I'm, I seen this coming around the roller. I said, good God. I said, what in the heck was that? They went to grab it. They didn't know what to do. So I've never seen nothing like that before. I thought it was a platypus. <laughs> he had that big, that big snout on it. It looked like he had wings and, and his nose was, was almost like rubber. I guess it was uh, cartilage, and we didn't know what it was anyway. So we just took it, put it aside, and later on we uh, took some pictures. So I put it on Facebook to try to find out if anyone knew what in the name of God we had. And I found out that uh, it was a long-nosed chimera. <laughs> that's, that's pretty incredible. According to DFO, the long-nosed chimera, long chimera is a cousin to sharks, and they can grow up to about five feet long. It is a deep water species that lives as far as 3,000 meters below the water's surface. So that's why we rarely see them. Fun fact, they're also incredibly scary to look at, as you just saw. Music lovers will have a venue to go to tonight as On the Road with Shanigan Knock takes the stage. The Navigators, the Ed and Sisters, and Shanigan Knock live playing for a parking lot full of cars. It's going to be different but good. I'm Jeremy Eaton. We're going to speak to the front man of that band coming up on Here and Now.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Now this weekend there's going to be a very unique concert series happening here in the Target parking lot and one of the men who helped put it together is Chris Andrews. Chris, what are we going to see on the stage behind you there? Well tonight, Jeremy, we're going to have uh, uh, the Navigators, the Ennis Sisters and Shandy Ganock live playing for a parking lot full of cars. It's going to be different but good. It's going to be a, a first real, I guess you could say, concert series that the city and the province has seen this year. And we want to provide a safe venue for everybody to come and enjoy and uh, get out and hear some music. So I know that you've been very vocal about the struggles uh, that musicians have had during the COVID-19 global pandemic. So where did this idea come from or why did you want to do it this way? Well, it's not a new idea, really. This has been done months ago in different places around North America. Uh, I'd waited for a while to see how we were going to progress with the rules and the alert levels and, and uh, see if someone else would do it. But no one did, you know. So I finally said, okay, uh, enough's enough kind of thing. I assembled a great team, uh, some of the best professionals here in the town in the music industry, and we put together this show, and uh, we're very glad we did. So how does it work? Like, it's, it's not like I can come through the gates and walk up and stand next to the stage. How, no, how you cannot. Gonna, yeah. <laughs> how are people going to be able to take in the show? Well, uh, you buy your tickets on uh, etixnow.com. That's E-T-I-X now, N-O-W.com. And you can enter through these. We have all kinds of different points of entry where we have also have private security. The RNC will also be present. Uh, when you drive in, you, you're directed to where you drive because it will be cars first, then SUVs, then trucks, motorhomes, and buses on the side. So everybody has a view of this beautiful stage. And you'll be able to tune in on your FM radios to hear the show. So that we're doing everything it takes to keep you in the car. You can get out to go to the washrooms. We have lots of washrooms and wash stations. You can also get out of your car to go to smoking sections. Uh, but they're also monitored for social distancing and we'll have security on all those. You and your band have played thousands of shows, if not more. How different is this going to be for, for the band when you're staring at a, a bunch of hoods and cars <laughs> and not faces? It's going to be different, no doubt. Uh, we did something similar many years ago on the mainland uh, that was planned that way. And it was, it was okay, you know, it was not the same, but it was okay. But we're, we have no other real option, you know, in order to keep people safe, not break the rules, follow the rules, help the province. This is the way to do it. This is the safest way to do it. And we wanted to put together something that could be for the family and for, you know, for everybody. So it's all ages, there's no alcohol, there's food delivery, you know, with Mary Brown's and the Boys and Girls Club. There's, you know, it's going to be a fun night and, and it is, it is different, but it's a good chance for us to get out and show uh, our love for Newfoundland and Labrador music, support, you know, a bunch of people getting a few days work that don't have any and, uh, and also, you know, get out in a crowd of people and have fun. Well, we were given the, uh, I guess, the privilege of coming here this evening to be able to provide a canteen service. It's a mobile canteen service, and uh, Shani Wart reached out to us so that we would be able to fundraise for our clubs here in St. John's. So we've got uh, multiple vehicles. We've got two uh, Mini Coopers provided to us by uh, Mini Cooper here in St. John's, and uh, we're going to be going around. Individuals can text in an order or they can send it in via Facebook and we'll bring it right to you in your car. We offer programming to about 700 uh, members over the course of the year and all the monies that we're going to raise this evening um, go directly to, 100% of it goes directly to programming and also to help with food insecurity. The ballots are in and the counting begins. Conservatives have mailed in their choice for a leader to replace Andrew Scheer. Now, Peter McKay is the highest profile candidate, a party stalwart. Aaron O'Toole is also a veteran who's held key posts. Rounding out the field are Derek Sloan and Leslin Lewis. They've been pushing hard to raise their profile and get the vote out. Now, the, conserv the Conservatives are set to announce the winner on Sunday. CBC News will have special coverage hosted by our chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton, with Power and Politics host, Vashi Capellos. It starts at 6.30 p.m. Island Time on CBC News Network and CBC TV. So that's a half hour earlier in most of Labrador. You can also watch it online and on CBC Gem. 
Now to south of the border. Joe Biden is now officially the U.S. Democratic provincial nominee. He accepted the party's nomination last night during the Democratic National Convention and called this a life-changing election. We'll determine what America is going to look like for a long, long time. Character is on the ballot. Compassion is on the ballot. Decency, science, democracy, they're all on the ballot. His keynote speech focused on the health crisis, economic uncertainty, racial justice, and climate change. The Democrats are trying to highlight their vision as a stark contrast from Donald Trump's, portraying the conservative, conservative incumbent as a threat to democracy. The Republican National Convention to renominate Trump is set to kick off in North Carolina next week. To sports now, triathlete Jesse English has actually stepped up his game despite COVID canceling many of his events. English is running and cycling to create, get this, GPS art. CBC producer Maria Burgos and videographer Graham Thompson tagged along to get the lowdown. So I started triathlons in 2016. I did two that year and just progressively started doing a few more every year until 2019 where I qualified for the triathlon world championships. That specific one, I'd been training for 10 uh, months straight. It was canceled in March. To stay motivated, I started looking at something I had seen before. It's called uh, GPS art, Strava art. And it's where a runner or a cyclist turns on their GPS and goes around their streets to draw art, essentially. So I look at a Google map and I just stare at it until I can find some sort of shape that resembles anything. I don't generally look for a specific design. I look at, you know, oh, this shape that looked like an elephant head. So I then spent a while drawing it out. On the computer, I can draw it out. What I often do now is I print out the blank map, put it in like a Ziploc bag, and I'll get a dry erase marker and draw over this blank map until I come up with a piece of art that resembles an animal or maybe it's a word, I'm, you know, a phrase I'm saying or something like that. I have the map in the Ziploc bag and there's stuff it in my pocket. I'll start running and whenever I come to a street that I have to turn on, I'm, I'm pulling out that map. I'm looking at which direction I have to go to make sure I stay on path. I use a pretty popular app among runners and cyclists called Strava. It's a social platform where you do an activity and it uploads and people can like it or comment. The biggest thing is though it shows a map of where you went. I've done a couple words, not really art, but like I did like a thank you to the healthcare workers. I did a, a Nova Scotia with a heart on it to show them support for that tragedy. So it's mainly uploaded to the Strava app. That's where I like it the most there because it, there's a bunch of runners on there and, and a lot of people have said they're really inspired to get out there, especially during that quarantine time frame where everybody, you know, all the gyms closed. And when they were seeing the art, I got a lot of comments that inspired them to get outside and do some running too. So probably the most engaged was the New Brunswick ship, you know, for New Brunswick Day. It's put on like a bike group on Facebook and it got like over 500 likes, a couple hundred comments, and by far the most engaged thing I've ever had on Facebook. I was like, well, I guess people like this, so. So for people who don't know, Strava is like workout Facebook. Uh, and so basically you can track uh, your movements, as he said there. Uh, I use Strava myself, but I, I can't draw anything. And I don't think many people around this province have started it. But maybe after seeing that report, they might. Now we're going to stick with sports. A minor league baseball team is determined to prevent a previous record from falling victim to COVID-19. The London Majors of the Inter-County Baseball League in Ontario are hosting an exhibition game to ensure that their home field retains its title as the world's longest continuously operating ballpark. Well-known local favorite and hero of ours in Newfoundland and Labrador, Devin Haru, takes a look at the pregame. A treasure trove of baseball history here in London, Ontario. I'm at Labatt Memorial Park and tonight they're going to keep an historic streak alive. 143 consecutive years they've played baseball games right here on these grounds. And in the midst of a pandemic, organizers, team officials, they were worried whether or not that streak would stay alive. So they got together, the grounds crew working around the clock, getting this field ready for an official exhibition game tonight between Guelph and London. This is a fierce rivalry. In fact, it was because 
of this rivalry that this stadium was built in 1877. There's a lot of excitement around the park here today, but there's also a lot of emotion. People care about baseball here in London. Take a listen to how they're preparing for tonight's game. Well, just to see the community come together, you know, from the city of London, the players, the volunteers, there's so many behind the scenes people, you know, you want to thank, but just to see everyone come together, it gives me goosebumps. Well, probably in my lifetime, this is probably my fondest memories. I played six years of professional hockey. I played in the National Hockey League, but I love baseball first. And when you come here, you're in in my opinion, this is the most beautiful place. Normally, outside of a pandemic on a Friday night in August, Labatt Memorial Park would be packed with thousands of people. Obviously, times have changed. Only about 100 family and friends are going to be allowed into these bleachers here tonight. But no question, everyone here in London and surrounding area, very excited that baseball is back at Labatt Memorial Park. And isn't it fitting that it is Guelph? and London playing here tonight to keep the streak alive. Where I'm standing in 1876, it used to be Swampland, then Cornfields. Now it's a field of dreams and the streak stays alive 144 consecutive years of baseball. Right here, Devin Haru, CBC News, London.
Welcome back to Here and Now. The Liquor Corporation has some new faces. The province has appointed two new people to its board of directors. Glenn Mifflin, the CEO of the international development group Cusco, is also a former executive with North Atlantic Refining. Also appointed is Donna Rideout, a chartered accountant and former chair of the Gander Airport Authority. Fraser Edison is reappointed for another three years and takes over as board chair, replacing Wayne Miles. Lastly, Victoria Belbin. She was also reappointed to the board and becomes vice chair. All members were appointed after being recommended by the Independent Appointments Commission. Sticking with liquor, 25 years ago, a business group had an innovative idea to make vodka using Newfoundland iceberg water or Bergie Bits. At the time, the province was handing out tax breaks to new businesses who were setting up shop here. But the industry minister had his doubts. We dipped into the Here and Now archives to bring you this story from 1995. Mariners in Newfoundland call this Bergie Water, those smaller chunks of ice Bergie Bits. Now, a group of Ontario investors wants to melt those Bergie bits and make vodka. The vodka will be manufactured from iceberg water, which, as you know, is virtually 99% pure. It'll be bottled here, marketed as Canadian iceberg vodka. The company says it's locating in Newfoundland because the government is giving a 10-year tax break to new businesses. These companies are going to get major tax concessions. That's what this bill is all about. They would not have come here otherwise. The iceberg vodka makers want to convert this old fish plant into their water production facility. Icebergs will be shipped here, melted in giant propane-fired kettles. Even the industry minister admits having some doubts. I sort of wonder about how you're going to get all these bergy bits, but that's your problem, not my problem. Fury says this is not like the 1980s, when Newfoundland sank $20 million into a failed attempt to grow hydroponic cucumbers. The government of Newfoundland has zero dollars invested in this. There is no cash, no grants, no loans. But under the new law, the government does offer, in addition to a tax holiday, free crown land and $2,000 cash for each job created. Economist Jim Fien is skeptical about Newfoundland's new law. Well, paying them to come in suggests that the business that's coming in isn't, isn't viable because you have to pay them to come in. Still, the province argues it's not up to government to judge the viability of companies like Iceberg Vodka. That's up to investors and the market. Tonda McCharles, CBC News, St. John's. A Halifax family has wrapped their 14-day quarantine on a 38-foot sailboat. The U family had planned to spend two years sailing down the coast of North America, but COVID cut those plans short. Robin Simon has more. Love each other, even though we've been in a confined space for a long period of time. The U family spent years planning their perfect getaway. They thought they'd be in Costa Rica by now, but didn't end up getting further than the Bahamas. It's been challenge after challenge for the family. Shortly after they left a year ago, they were hit by Hurricane Dorian. There's really no way to capture what it feels like when 75, 80 knot winds and beyond um, hit a small boat in the open water. Um, it was uh, an experience I won't ever forget. But they carried on, sailing south, and that's when they hit challenge number two, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but for the most part, we were locked down so severely that even taking the dinghy with the outboard for a tour or even swimming wasn't allowed. So um, we spent a lot of time looking at paradise without being able to interact. When they heard Prime Minister Trudeau call for Canadians to come home, they abandoned their dream and started heading north. And we uh, made our way to the United States, to, uh, to Florida and then spend a lot of time staying away from people, being in very small areas, trying to pick up groceries when we needed to, as we ran both from a global pandemic, I guess, and, and also from bad weather. It took them three months to get back, and they were in Canadian waters by July. Of course, that meant a mandatory 14-day isolation period on their boat. For a family of three in such a small space, it had its challenges. Well, thankfully, I have my own door of my bed on, in my bedroom, so I can just close the door and I don't even have to see them for a long time if I don't want to. This is my orca whale, Clyde. Sienna says it was hard at first, 
but the 10-year-old did get used to it, even had fun doing it. After all, the boat was named after her. When my mom and dad were trying to pick out a boat for the trip, and they had two boats left, and they were pretty much exactly the same. So they just came to me and said, which one do you want? And I kind of just pointed and said, this one. So despite going through a hurricane and living in the midst of a pandemic, Tony doesn't regret setting sail. Well, well, in fact, the main goal, to be honest, wasn't only about sailing. It was about spending time together as a family in a way that's very rare in the modern world. Um, I wanted to find opportunities to help reinforce ideas of resilience, in particular with my daughter. But they sold their belongings and rented their house, and they're still on sabbatical for another year. So the U family doesn't know what's next. In a few months, another challenge, winter which leaves Sienna thinking about the place she just left behind. So I would much rather be in a warmer climate, but you know, I guess it's okay to be back, but I'd much rather be in the Bahamas. <laughs> Robin Simon, CBC News, Halifax.
Well, it's time to bring Ashley back so we can get a recap of the weather. Ashley. Yes, so uh, we started off beautiful here in St. John's today. The weekend's actually looking fairly beautiful for most of eastern Newfoundland, but as we head towards central areas uh, tomorrow, we're looking at the slight chance of a few showers. Overall, a mix of sun and clouds. Sunday becomes a little bit more unsettled, certainly for the northern peninsula and along the north uh, coast there. We could see the potential for some showers, but uh, temperatures will be in the 20s for the majority of the island. Up through the big land, though, that area of low pressure still affecting your weather so you're looking at the potential for some showers pretty much through the weekend however a little bit more sun will peak out on Sunday a very happy 50th wedding anniversary to Granya and Patrick Baker formerly from Marystown now living in St. John's happy anniversary to Nick and Bonnie Power on August 15th congratulations to Bill and Stella Troke of Eastport who will be celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary on Saturday August 22nd Happy 61st wedding anniversary to Betty and George Bryant, formerly of New Perlican, now living in Carboneer. Happy 50th anniversary on August 21st to Majors Henry and Beatrice Bingle from Deer Lake. Happy 64th anniversary to George and Mary Mitchellmore of Green Island Cove. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Melvin and Vivian McDonald of Bay Bulls, who were married on August 17th, 1970. Doug and Linda Churchill, Doug and Linda Churchill of Glovertown will be celebrating their 50th on August 17th. Rudy and Yvonne Oxford of Springdale are celebrating 52 years of marriage today. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Harvey and Donna Nissy living in Cornerbrook. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Alphonsus and Margaret Ducey of Keels, Bonavista Bay. Happy 59th wedding anniversary to Audrey and Claude Elford in Quarterbrook, who will celebrate their anniversary on the 19th. Happy 50th anniversary to Val and Linda Hartson. A happy 53rd anniversary to Doug and Elsie Wells, who celebrated on August 19th. Happy 55th wedding anniversary to Jeanne and Des Dillon of Gander. Happy 50th anniversary to Vivian and Melvin McDonald from Bay Bulls. A happy 50th wedding anniversary to Sandra and Daryl Piercy of Cornerbrook. Happy 64th anniversary to Fred and Alice Kavanagh of St. John's. Earl and Effie Kendall are celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary on August the 25th. Currently, they live in Hermitage, but are formerly from Galtis. Happy 58th wedding anniversary to Ross and Gladys Bartlett of Burlington. Happy 53rd anniversary to Randy and Annie Whalen of Hodges Cove. A happy 57th anniversary to Cecil and Juanita Chater of Northern Arm, formerly from Labrador City. Happy 63rd anniversary to Raymond and Gladys Payne of Stephenville. It's a happy 52nd anniversary to Gordon and Elsie Murphy. A happy 50th wedding anniversary today to Hartley and Lorraine Smith of Normans Cove. A happy 60th anniversary to Clayton and Gertie Russell of Coley's Point. We're going to wish a very happy 57th wedding anniversary to John and Carmel Power of St. John's, whose anniversary is on the 24th. A very happy 65th wedding anniversary to Ralph and Beatrice Coombs of Bay Despair. Happy 57th anniversary to Ruth and Ern Cluett, who celebrated on the 17th. On August 21st, Sherman and Rosalind Wheeler will be celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. A happy 50th anniversary to Jim and Mary Pink of Virgio. A happy 50th wedding anniversary to Doris and Francis Clark of Happy Valley Goose Bay. Happy anniversary to Shirley and Jerry Canning of Two Good Arm, Newfoundland, who are celebrating 55 years together. A happy 58th anniversary on August 22nd to Larry and Harriet Lane of Glovertown. A happy 56th anniversary to John and Madeline Hamilton. A happy 61st, happy 61st anniversary to Vera and Kelvin Burns. A happy 56th wedding anniversary to Fred and Margaret Perry, formerly of Portugal Cove South. A happy 55th anniversary to Howard and Ruth Martin of Bryant's Cove. A happy 50th anniversary to Anne Rowe and George Rowe from St. John's. A happy 98th birthday to World War II veteran Annie Keeping, formerly of Point Rosie, Fortune Bay. It's a happy 97th birthday to Michael Bridgman living in Pickering, Ontario. He's formerly from St. Brendan's in Bonavista Bay. We're going to wish Marie Bennett living in Cape St. George a happy 92nd birthday, which was yesterday. 
Herdy King of Hens Harbor celebrated her 95th birthday on August the 15th. It's also a happy 95th birthday to Violet Taylor in Port of Basque, who will be celebrating on September 9th. Louisa Pike of Charleston, now living in Clarenville Retirement Center, is celebrating her 94th birthday on August 22nd. A happy birthday to Gladys Dowden of Greens Pond, now residing at Orms Basida Manor in Gander. Bill Rose of Grand Bank, who will celebrate his 92nd birthday on Tuesday, August the 25th. We're wishing a very happy birthday to Margaret Hillier of St. John's, who will be 96 years young on August 25th. It's a happy 90th birthday to Max Marsh, who is formerly of Deer Harbor. And speaking of big birthdays, there's one more to add to that list. A pooch on Prince Edward Island just marked a major milestone. Boots has just turned 21. And there he is. Charlie Burke first got Boots when she was in kindergarten. She's now 26 years old, and Boots has been there for all of it. Graduations, breakups, the birth of her daughter. Now, Boots is a Jack Russell Terrier and Poodle mix. They have a life expectancy of about 12 to 15 years, so not too bad for Boots. Charlie hopes he'll make it to her wedding, which is set for next summer. Attaboy, Boots. One young baker is betting her future on a small business in Kings Point. It's the latest in our food and fun series. But first, let's a quick reminder, this was all filmed before COVID, so that means there is no social distancing. Take a look. We're in beautiful Kings Point at Ocean View Convenience, and we're about to try the best cupcakes on the island. I'm at Ocean View Convenience with Alyssa Burt, and today we're going to talk about cupcakes. Awesome. Okay. So your cupcakes are famous. Yes. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> yeah. Um, and when you opened this place, there was no cupcake business. No, there wasn't. What gave you this idea? Oh, I just thought it was neat that uh, people come here for gas, everyday things, and uh, at the same time they could uh, grab something sweet. So today you're going to show us how to make these cupcakes. Yeah. Now. We're not going to learn anything about the actual cake recipe because that's top secret. Of course. Well, all right. <laughs> but we're going to decorate them. Yes. So we're doing Halloween decorations today. We are. Perfect. Yes. Okay, so what's our first step? We are going to pick out some colors, which I have uh, some fall colors picked okay. out for us. And we're just going to uh, grab a color. Okay. And I have to tell you, this is my weakness. <laughs> I could sit down with a box set of television. Ooh, that dated me. <laughs> uh, and just eat a whole bowl of icing. Yep. I love it. Before you opened this place up, did you have um, a cake decorating business? Uh, not exactly. I did uh, do it on my own as a, a hobby, just uh, myself and for my friends. Yep. But uh, when I came here, I thought it was the perfect opportunity yeah. to, uh, to bring it here as well. So mine is pretty much done. So, just grab a bag. Okay. And I'm actually going to use more than one color, if you would like to do that. Oh, you put more than one color in here? I am, yeah. Oh, cool. Today, yeah. Look how much neater Alyssa's is than mine. No, That's it. <laughs> okay. You've got some big plans for this place. Yes. Can yep. you tell us about them? Yeah, sure. Uh, I guess um, I just do it uh, part time now, or I guess there's not always something here. And uh, hopefully in the near future that will change uh, when we put in a bakery and a kitchen here at the store. Right now uh, I'm home based. Yeah. So it kind of restricts me as to what I can do and how much yep. and whatnot. Yeah. So when we move here, we will uh, have goodies here always <laughs> and I'm fortunate that right on the back of my building uh, overlooks the water yeah and it'll be the perfect place to uh, sit down take in the view and have a little have, bakery have a cupcake I love it <laughs> yeah. should we try them where should Andy go for food and fun send her a message food and fun at cpc.ca 
So Andy gets to eat cupcakes. Ashley gets to hang outside. What does Jeremy get to do? Stand inside. Anyways, it was uh, my pleasure to be here all week uh, filling in for Carolyn Stokes. Uh, she'll be back uh, next week, so you can get probably won't see this for a while. But anyways, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun to be here for the week. I uh, appreciate uh, you all tuning in to spend part of your evening with us here on Here and Now. And that's it for us tonight and next week. And as I said, Carolyn Stokes will be back on Monday. And uh, in the meantime, have a good weekend. And if you can, enjoy the sunshine because summer is coming to an end. Have a good night, everybody. Take care.